we're sitting in the living room of Chris and Alice and uh, we're going to interview our honoured guests <laughs> um, um, on their, um, their uh, background in, in dance in general, but particularly in quadrilles. And to do this interview, we have our expert, our expert, Paul Cooper, our former dancer who did dance with English Quadrille and many other notable groups. Former and, dancer. And I, <laughs> former dancer with English Quadrille, that's probably what I say. Um, and who has known both Chris and Ellis for at least 35 years, you say? Yes, it's a very years. long time. 36 years. So that's, that's the party here. And uh, we're going to attempt to extract all sorts of interesting information out of our um, our guests. It'll be this evening when it, when this goes live, um, Chris and Alice Rogers. So I think we begin. Paul, you have some leading questions to pose to our our um, <coughs> guests this evening. Indeed. So um, well, <laughs> hello to Chris and Alice. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm thrilled to be here today in that nice rainy uh, Orpington. <laughs> um, but yeah, you guys have been pioneers within our, our community, and uh, gosh, you must have an awful lot of anecdotes and tales that you can tell. But I was just wondering if you could give us a, a little summary of you know what you've you've done in early dance over the years. Um, uh, what, what kind of things have you been involved with? Well, we uh, early dance. Um, as far as we was concerned, um, when I was much, much younger, um, was American stuff because American square dancing was in the age when I was the sort of age I started dancing, 16, 17. And I was uh, helping to run a youth club in those times and uh, looking for things to amuse the people in the youth club. We used to bring in uh, Patrick Children Shaw of the English Folk Dance and Song Society and he gave a few lessons to the club and uh, I got the interest and then went to Cecil Sharp House and started, as I thought at that time, using English folk dancing and each year they had a festival at the Albert Hall where they had a special group of dancers who they uh, interviewed to make sure they got some good dancers and put on the show at the Albert Hall and sometimes they called in specialists who would introduce what we would now call real historical dancing. I think the first um, expert was Belinda Quarry, wasn't it? Yes. And she came down and got it from the ballet point of view and introduced a few dancers from the ballet company, which you know. And uh, we did a few 18th century stuff at the Albert Hall, and that was our real introduction to dancing. But. Um, the big switch over came when we were told that we were getting too old to be a demonstration team for the English Folk Dance and Song Society. I mean, we were getting old, we were 35, weren't we, Christy? You so. were 35, I was a lot younger. <laughs> and not even younger. And um, so we thought we'd look around for something for our old age and advertise by the um, Dolmish Society was the dancers of Shakespeare's time. So we thought we'd go along to this and we thought it'd be all easy stuff, you know, posturing lots of dolls, and found out it nearly killed us because they wanted us dance galliards and things that were twice as it, more effort than we ever used in folk dancing. But that is where we caught the ballad and kept going back to the various uh, summer schools that were run by the Dolmo Society then. And uh, in the time they on these uh, courses, they referred us original books, mainly French, about uh, early dance. And uh, I looked at these books, and being a bit of a um, investigator in some way, we decided that we didn't agree with some of the things we were being taught by uh, Belinda and by uh, Thomas. So we started doing our own research. And that uh, involved learning to read French <laughs> for dance books, which was really hard. <laughs> and uh, that's how we got into the dancing, really, into the early historical dance, through the Dolmish Historical Dance Society. Later on, we went to summer schools with uh, Peggy Dixon, who ran the Nunsuch Early Dance Group. And 
they were had a different view on the, the same dances and it's always nice to be found in the end to go to several dances who teach slightly different ways and then try and read the original books and compare them and see whether they actually one agree with the books and again whether they agree with other dancing masters and in the end I suppose you you decide that you would learn the style of the teacher you like best so if you're going to be a teacher, it's always best to be very friendly to your pupils, otherwise <laughs> they won't come back again. <laughs> so that's how we got into that dancing. The more we danced, the more we realised that it only went up to the, uh, the end of the 18th century. Nobody was teaching stuff later than the 18th century until we found ourselves teaching fairly readily for the Oxford Historical Dance Society. And their leader was Diana Porteous, who was uh, played the clarinet, uh, and uh, was a peri. What do they call these teachers that go around teaching at different Tessie. schools? Peri yes, <laughs> that's, that's one. And she said, well, "Next Christmas on the house, Christmas course, we want you to teach Victorian dancing." And Chris and I looked at one another and said, "Well, we don't know anything about Victorian." And she said, "You've got three months to learn." <laughs> She was rather like that time. We so called we, it the Iron Mouse. The Iron Mouse, yeah. So we went to such a sharp house and spent the next three months practically camped out in the library to learn Victorian dance and got into quadrilles and cotillions from that sort of thing. And that was the beginning of the hard work as far as we concerned. Up to then we'd done it for our enjoyment, but from then on it was for learning enough to teach others. So that's the answer of how we got started on this sort of thing. We had that problem in Japan. Um, well, on the last day, of a visit to Japan where I was teaching, um, they decided, well, we've um, arranged for you to give a lecture at the uh, Tokyo Museum of Cultural Museum. We, we were to show you the museum in the morning and then in the, after, the afternoon we want you to give in the lecture hall with this lecture. And they would be so um, much about this, well, uh, European dance rhythms in the 19th century. So I said, fine. And then that, we went to lunch. And during lunch, they had a bunch of thieves broke into the museum, switched all the lights off, and pinched all the stuff I'd taken to um, play the music, all my records, all the tapes, all the notes and illustrations we had in our luggage. And they took the lot. the lot, took the lot. So there I was. I had two hours to change, uh, to think up a, a lecture without any music and any dance. <laughs> and there was quite, the, the lecture hall in the Museum of Culture, it's quite a big place, you know, it's going to be full. Mm -hmm. So I was standing there wondering what the devil to do. And a couple, an American couple, walked up and said, we understand you've got a problem. <laughs> I said, you could say that. And he said, well, I have this tape. Is it any good to you? Is it a quarter-inch cassette? And it was done at American dances at the time of the War of Separation from England, War of Independence. And it was all tunes that we knew in different rhythms, a waltz, jig, um, reel, hornpipe. Yeah. And I sat down with this tape and played it through and made notes of every tune and the number of bars in each tune and the, what the rhythms were and rewrote in my head the whole lecture you did the music from this quarter inch tape. <laughs> and then I said, well, look, what about the dances you've heard? I said, oh, well, don't worry about that. So I got up and started to teach and I got the audience to do the, rep the demonstrations themselves. And it worked like a charm because where I would have had big gaps in my talk, having only just music, I was able to get the audience to get up and dance sessions which filled in the time 
and it was a success. We got quite a cheer at the end. That that was about the most nerve-wracking things that ever happened. I don't know whether the barbers had the same effect. Sometimes when we're teaching ball, they suddenly ask you to do something you just haven't the faintest preparation for at all. And again in Japan, they said, well, you give a lecture. And I said, well, do they understand English? He said, here and there. <laughs> <laughs> they were not polite. So I said, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> he said, well, right dictate the whole of the lecture that I want you to give about, this again, about 19th century dance in Europe. Um, and I have something, type it overnight, and then I have a copy, and every person in the audience will have the, the script in Japanese <laughs> as well as in English. So they can have it in front of them and listen to your talking and hear half of it and get the translation from the, the thing in front of them. Incredibly organised, the Japanese. So when they say they're going to do something like that. But again, you say you have to join. Uh, connect with the audience mm -hmm. and I said I'm going to do this but rehearse saying good morning to the audience in Japanese to start off with so they had to all stand up and say it back in English so that was a good start <laughs> and then halfway through I said there's no humor in this so far it's all factual so I had mentioned the problem of the change of dress in Krillins and the making frames and that some, some invention invented a frame which was pneumatic tubes, like the inner, inner tube of a bicycle tyre, which you blew up with a pair of bellows to make the frame for the dress. And I, I mined this on the stage, being blown up, you know, and then I said when they sat down there, they were un undoing this vow, and there was such a sss and I did mine, you know. And then they were all laughing, I thought, oh, well, I've got away this. <laughs> the Japanese, he found, listen very carefully and they learn mm. um, very well visually. Yes, uh, they've got that photographic minds, haven't they? Useful for Ellis. Um, I mean, he's been to Japan four or five times. I've only been a couple of times. But, um, when he was over there at the same time as Richard Powers, he had a class of 1300. And yes. they were quiet, weren't they? Yes. And and it was uh, in the Olympic swimming pool that had been boarded over. And uh, they were rehearsing for a ball in the evening. And 1300, they, yeah. that's extraordinary. Yes, Richard or Ellis? Ellis. 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 Mm -hmm. but, um, how, how, would you how would you divide them up? This is quadrilles or uh, dancers? Uh, yes, it was, uh, uh, the dancers mainly, and uh, a polka mazurka, mm -hmm. Varsoviana, and uh, something else I talked. Um, but with a class of 1300, you you've got to rely an awful lot on their being sympathetic to you. But I think they've been taught by various other teachers or so from Europe and other places, so they're quite used to this sort of thing happening. But their photographic memory for watching to dance can have a, a bad side, because if you mistake, make a mistake yourself, then that is built into their way of doing it for the rest of their life. <laughs> that, that story is of, of, of the top lady calling the dance, and if she calls something ridiculous, everybody has to do it all the way We had this problem in Canada where we were teaching, and I, I taught one dance, I think it was um, a play for dance for a set of uh, three couples, and just for a laugh, halfway through it, the band changed the music to quite modern sort of thing. And we put in the sort of uh, black and white minstrel show, hand movements, you know, like this. And some years later, we saw something on YouTube and they were still doing that particular <laughs> So you have to be careful. But you think they thought it might be real? Hmm? Did they think it might be real? <laughs> I don't think so, no, they don't. They, they, they just like fun. fun. But they, thought was, they thought it was a nice, an added <laughs> touch to the, the, the dance. Uh, talking about things going wrong, when we went to Canada, 
we were going to teach in the university, which was air conditioned and beautifully set up. The day before we got there, they cut through the main electricity cable just to find the whole university. And the temperature was up in the 90s Fahrenheit. So it, 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 was, you know, it was incredible. So they decided there was no one in the town that both of us could teach together. So they separated us. And Chris had to give, teach 16th century dancing around dance hall. And I get, was teaching the history of English folk dance in another dance hall. <laughs> so you have to be prepared for everything, even for going out to lunch. I, I, I was teaching in um, Morris, you know, well, uh, white awesome. stockings, black knee breeches, you know, and a white shirt. And I walked out in the middle of this Canadian <laughs> town in this outfit and got, got quite a few street, uh, funny looks and the men, but everybody was incredibly polite, you know, nobody criticised you, they just thought, oh, he's a weirdo, I suppose. Um, no, one woman said to me, gee, your husband's a snappy dresser. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, we got caught out in the same sort of way the first time we went to Japan. Um, we were running a course, a short course, five days in Tokyo, and uh, Professor Ikema, who arranged for us to go out there, Ken, called for short, um, said to us, the uncle of the emperor is a very keen dancer and he's going to come and attend your class. <laughs> so we were a bit worried about this, but he was a very nice chap. He said, He'd re he was 71 and he'd recently had to give up ice dance, but he still did all the other sorts of dancing and he was looking forward to adding this. So I can dance the minuet with him, which was nice. Um, but he said, I'll take you out to lunch. Um, we only have an hour, uh, no time to change, no time for anything, quick, quick, downstairs into the car. He had a partner he brought with him, not his wife, she was young and very beautiful. <laughs> And she, she drove the car, which was a little sports car with a, a dicky seat in the back. Yeah. So there was the prince and his uh, partner who was driving, and three of us, uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Akema, who fortunately is very small, Ellis and I, shoved in the back. And we drove to what is quite simply, I think, the best restaurant in Japan, in the middle of somewhere like Kens Kensington Gardens. Yeah. And pulled up outside the restaurant and they rolled out a red carpet right to the door of the car <laughs> and uh, Prince Mikasa got out, his partner got out and the three of us in the back burst out <laughs> and fell all over the place. Walked up to the door and the prince had stopped to talk to somebody so we all stood back and he said no no go in, go in, go in. <laughs> so we went through the door and the restaurant was packed with men in beautiful western suits and women in full Japanese outfits. Uh, the red carpet went straight through the middle of all of them and it was lined with waiters who were bowing. They did, I don't know if it's changed now, but they did bow all the time in Japan. We got quite used to it. I was wearing Marks and Spencer's trousers, a homemade top and my hair tied up in a, in a scarf. Ellis was wearing brown shoes, white stockings, black knee breeches, a white shirt, open necked and no tie, and an anorak that had split a couple of days before and was stuck up with seven. So, so this man has been taken <laughs> so a typical, I was typical English dress, and ever since the Japanese have have, have adopted this the way. <laughs> Well, I just say, what the hell, I'm an Englishman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mark, and led the procession you. down at centre of the red carpet. With all, the, all the guests and the, 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 the waiters bowing. All the, well, the waiters were bowing. We the went, guests were all looking to see what was going on. They were nutting. Somebody once said, what do you think they were saying? I said, well, they're saying, who's that Japanese bloke with Ellis Wilkes? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there must be very few people, Chris, who can, who can claim to have danced a minuet with the uncle of the Emperor of Japan. <laughs>
guess you'd be involved in early dance. Certainly you've all seen the formation, the foundation of the early dance circle, but you've been involved with Dolmetch, the historical dance society, for many years as well. Um, I guess you've seen an awful lot come. And, and yes, well, do you know Simon Kowadek Evans? Uh, I, I do not. Well, he was, a, he was um, a person who produced symphony concerts. He was a, a commission August to places like the Album Hall and things like that. And he got fed up with listening <coughs> to hundreds of minuets because every symphony had a minuet movement in it, and he didn't know the dance. So he put an advertisement in the papers, asked anybody who's interested in um, minuets and early dance, would they contact him? And this is where he started forming the early dance circle. He had this big meeting in the festival hall, and we went along, so we became Founder members. Founder members. Well, Barbara. <laughs> Barbara was another Barbara. founder member. Uh, yes, yeah, so Simon was me member number one, and when number two and three. <laughs> was I three? <laughs> yes. I three? Well, I never, <laughs> I never knew that. You might be. Oh, little bit old. Fifty-seven, sixty-six. You were, you were late paying your subscription. Probably. <laughs> 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 Uh, Chris, you were its first chairman, weren't you? Chairman? No, Simon. No, 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 Simon. 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 The second I, I was, I was chairman only for a very short time. It's Simon not. Simon must be the first. Mm. Not my area of expertise. <laughs> Simon, the, you're the archivist. You're supposed to know these things, aren't you? Simon was quite a um, moving. He, he was. He was, about him now. he was but an he, impresario, wasn't he? That was yes. his, his he, he role. From the uh, Common Garden Minuet Company to dance the dancers he wanted to, to see to go in with his music. And he uh, had a, a strong joint uh, presence in America. There where he also held concerts. And he, while he was in America, he met a group of folk dance enthusiasts who started doing early dance. And he decided he wanted a, a bit more teaching for them, so he invited me to go over to America to teach oh. his group in, in America. So this was our first teaching outside England. Um, but I didn't want to go. Teach them. Well, I couldn't go, I was working. He went over, but he was willing to pay for me as well. And he, he wanted Ellis to teach a two hour class. Yes. So All that expense for two hours. And keep us over there for a weekend because mm. they were doing a Victorian weekend in Wilmington in North Carolina. And as it happened, on the plane. <laughs> on the plane where we met the members of the Cotton Garden Minuet Company, as you might expect. But all the, the, all the girls' husbands or boyfriends were members of the Sherlock Holmes Society. So he, and he, he decided they would write a play that they would give him in Ruby Mountain about Sherlock Holmes. And they, they wrote this play called Mr. Watson, I Don't Give a Damn. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to be a play where the Wilmington local um, government, state government, was going to apply back to Queen Victoria to rejoin the English Empire. So <laughs> this was political dynamite, and they worked it into a, uh, a play which involved breaking into, a, a, the detectives, breaking into a speakeasy because um, prohibition of alcohol sales were supposed to be prohibited at that time. And when they broke in, there was a, they had girl can-can dancers dancing to entertain the peace drinkers. And I went along to one of the rehearsals that we were holding, and I was in the audience, slowly going, to, slowly going to sleep. When one of the girls' dancers, Beverly, Beverly. came up. Beverly came, Griffith. Hmm? Beverly Griffith, I think. Beverly, Beverly Griffith, yes. Came up and said, We are short of one, another <laughs> dancer. Um, she did, or something. Do you think you could come and work during the rehearsal, uh, take her place? So I said, yeah, anything. You know, so I went down to help. And they got me doing this little can-can dance. And when it came to the evening performance, <laughs> they again came out to me and said, she's still little. Can we dress you up as a girl and have you as a can-can dance in that play? And being like an idiot, believing every word they said, I went along and got dressed in a long golden wig, fishnet stockings and bare legs, can-can 
sort of panties and a short skirt on and they had me dancing in front of this full theatre of strictly uh, religious based audience. So this, <laughs> all, this, this plot had all been Who's carefully this? planned beforehand so oh, that yes. they were, <laughs> so rather than confront had they confronted with you <laughs> right at the beginning that you might have declined. So. <laughs> Yes, I didn't find out I was conned until I picked up a program <laughs> and found I was in the program. <laughs>